Hello, my friends. This is the 46th episode of Patterson in Pursuit. I am way overdue for some interview breakdowns. We're going back all the way to episode number 30 with my interview at Harvard with Dr. Janet Giazzo talking about Buddhism. I really loved this conversation, and oftentimes when a Westerner holds Buddhist ideas, they do so in a very, like, hippy-dippy way. And Dr. Gyatso was not hippy-dippy at all. She's totally down-to-earth, versed in philosophy, has a good sense of humor, very frank and blunt. So we really hit it off and can't wait to break it down for you. Before we start, I want to give you an update. My wife and I are currently in Wanaka, New Zealand. We have left Auckland. We've flown into Queenstown, which is on the South Island, and then we've arrived in Wanaka, and in a few days we are going to Christchurch. I'm doing an interview there, and then we are flying to Sydney, Australia, where I've got some interviews that, ooh, I just can't wait, but I can't tell you about just yet. Also, if you've been following along with the Jason Brennan crowdfunding review of Square One, this past week has been utterly insane. So Jason finished the review, and it was exactly as I was hoping it would be. Very critical, very much not about the ideas, and I wanted to use it as an example of some of the pettiness and even anti-intellectualism of some participants within academia, and it didn't disappoint. But in only a matter of days, it turned into this gigantic shit show, <laughs> because once I posted um, Brennan's review to my website. Uh, I did a video review on my YouTube channel. I was very, very, very critical, and he didn't like that. So he went from, you know, mocking my ideas and mocking my person on Facebook and publicly to going into calling me a criminal and a plagiarist and a thief, and I stole his intellectual property. And it was this really sad and unfortunate a situation, which, I mean, if I'm going to be honest, right, this was part of my point in taking on the project. It was just such an extreme example that it devolved into character assassination. So if you guys are interested in drama, then check out my YouTube channel, youtube.com slash Steve Patterson. Now you guys know, because I talk about it all the time on the show, that this kind of pettiness is one of the reasons why I have rejected the academic route, where I'm trying to capitalize on being a philosopher online, being able to do what I'm doing. And there is a large and growing movement of us that recognize just how far off track academia has gone and just how poor of a monetary investment it is for anybody that's you know looking to go to college. Fortunately, the sponsor of the show Praxis is a company that is on the front line of this movement where their entire existence is based on taking people who are young, competent, and enthusiastic, training them in three months, and then placing them immediately at a apprenticeship where they get paid and they get real-world job experience. So rather than trying to learn about the world by sitting in a classroom and reading a bunch of textbooks written by people who've never experienced the real world, have no idea how it operates, Praxis is a program that shortcuts that entire system and the net cost to participants is zero dollars. And last I've seen, the average salary of Praxis participants after completing their program is $50,000 a year. So in virtually every way, it is superior than going to college. I think there are very, very few exceptions. So if that sounds like something that you're interested in, you want to join us in the real world, then head over to steve-patterson.com slash Praxis, P-R-A-X-I-S, and see if the program is right for you. So I really hope you guys enjoy this breakdown with Dr. Janet Giazzo talking about Buddhism. What I find, and I hope is, is clear at this point, is rational individuals are way, way, way too comfortable with dismissing ideas out of hand. I think in almost every circumstance, it's because they don't understand the ideas. Buddhism is one of those cases. A religion in general, and Buddhism, whether or not Buddhism is a religion, is, of course, just a taxonomic question, but any of these world, big worldview philosophies that aren't strictly scientific, a lot of people just poo-poo straight off the bat and say, there's, there's nothing to learn here. I think this is a catastrophic mistake. Even if you don't agree with the ideas in Buddhism, you have to force yourself to understand them. You have to see their line of reasoning 
and understand it so that you know whether or not you're justified in rejecting the ideas. That's what I'm trying to do with the interview, and that's what I'm going to try to do with the breakdown. Say, look, there's actually a lot of meat here. There's a fantastic argument to be made, even if, like me, you don't agree with it. Enjoy. The self is a very important term in Buddhism, and it's one of the sort of key doctrinal insistence that um, the self is generally a construct that we create, and it doesn't have, it doesn't refer to anything that exists independently in the world, but rather it's dependent upon how we construct it, and uh, many things go into its construction. All right, I really love this position, and I think it's beautiful. And if you guys have listened to my commentary on metaphysics about inanimate objects, this is just a beautiful natural corollary of that. So in a nutshell, my argument, which I actually believe, is that what physically exists are base units of space-time, those units are arranged in particular ways, and we reference particular arrangements of space-time as objects. So, for example, I have a water bottle in front of me. It's not the case that there is such a thing as a objectively mind-independently existing water bottle. It's that there are bits of matter which are arranged in a particular way that I simply reference as a water bottle. If I were not around, the water bottle itself wouldn't exist. <clears throat> so, it is itself a concept. It is something that has a mind-dependent existence. This is taking that idea and applying it to the self. It's saying that what I am, what I think I'm referencing, it's like referencing the water bottle in that when I'm conceiving of it, yeah, it kind of exists, but if I stopped conceiving of it, it would stop existing. So the idea is that the self really isn't an independent thing which is why when you quiet your mind, they might say, with meditation, you experience what you actually are, which is not a self. So I don't agree with this, but I think it's beautiful. And so one of the biggest points in all of Buddhist thought is that we need to be aware of this fact because the ensuing attachment we have to any idea or definition that we have of ourselves as a self gets in the way and leads to a lot of problems. In fact, it's one of our worst problems. So one area that I think people get confused by, especially if they have a more rationalist disposition, is when they're listening to or hearing you know, Eastern mystics or Buddhists or Hindus, a lot of times they say things like, the mind will mislead you. Or they say, you know, you have to stop the questioning process. Or they say things that sound very anti-intellectual. And I used to hear these things and go, oh, well, that's the complete opposite of everything I stand for. This is ridiculous. <clears throat> then I started looking a little bit deeper. And you can't take their claims uh, literally like that. So what she said is, you know, our conception of the self gives us all kinds of problems. In other words, because our concepts, in effect, construct ourselves, we construct the world, we mistake the true nature of existence. The true nature of existence is without essence, which is something we'll talk a little bit later in this interview. Your mind is tricking you into thinking that the things you come up with in your mind are independently existing phenomena. So the objects that you see, the people that you conceive of as being like yourself, all of this is kind of an illusion. And if you over-intellectualize with the concepts that you've created, you're going to be misleading yourself from the truth. So it's not anti-intellectualism or irrationalism just for its own sake. It's actually making a truth claim. It's saying the path towards enlightenment is not one spent in the world of your own artificial conceptual constructions. The path towards enlightenment is actually recognizing what your mind is doing, which is in effect constructing the world, and stopping that process and just being and seeing what is. Now, in 
Hindu philosophy that goes one step farther. I don't think, maybe this is in some Buddhist philosophy, but I know in Hindu philosophy they say, what actually is, you'll discover, is everything. So what you actually are is not a self separate from anything else. You are actually everything. <laughs> or as they might say, you know, all is one. Now, that if that's true, that's got or that has that's a really big deal, and it's beautiful and it's humbling. Um, I don't think it's true, but it's something that before we refute or mock as being anti-intellectual, we better understand what they're actually claiming. So the clearer we conceive of what our minds are actually doing, I think the more accurate worldview we have, and the less likely we are to be tripped up by our own minds. I guess for me, when I think of the self, it has this very intimate connection with the mind, with consciousness, but it's almost one layer deeper that there is, it's not just the phenomena of consciousness, it's my consciousness. It's that I, that I feel like I'm this being with the, who is experiencing these things. It's not just the experience is happening, it's that it's my experience, that mm -hmm. me part. Yeah. So that me part, you're saying that's a construction, can we... Can we dive a little more into that? So what does it mean for something to be a construction? Is it an illusion? Is it something that doesn't actually exist? Is it something, is it a concept that we think actually has some kind of independent existence, but really it doesn't? No, it is a concept. And it, it does exist as an illusion. I mean, this is like one of these difficult things that is, I'm floating in front of my class all the time. I'm teaching my intro to Buddhism class and we're talking about all these questions. Uh, but um, the my part of the my consciousness has a lot of different um, meanings and, and in what that my consists and what its status is with respect to consciousness could be quite different. It's not obvious exactly what that means. And Buddhists would say that, yeah, it doesn't, there is no independent ex existence of this entity that would allow the genitive pronoun my to uh, stand on its own other than an idea that we create or a way of explaining things to ourselves. So I love it. This is one of the things I find so fascinating by Eastern philosophy is their conceptions of the self and the difficulty with conceptions of the self. And my own position, <clears throat> which I am very reluctant and I'm, I don't like this conclusion, but my own position is that if it is true that there is such a thing as the self that exists even when it is not being conceived, then I think that forces you into something like the existence of a soul, the existence of a person. This is what I was talking about with the interview breakdown with Professor Brahm about machines and consciousness, that it is either the case that you have a self <laughs> or you don't have a self. There's no wiggle room here. If the self is conceptually constructed, then it is illusory. But if the self is not conceptually constructed, if when I'm referencing myself, I'm actually referencing something that would exist without it being referenced or conceived, then I think that pushes us, unfortunately, into something like the existence of a soul. And that is the position that I am tentatively holding because it's very hard for me to accept the idea that what I'm referencing by the term I isn't. <laughs> or that it's illusory or non-existent or conceptually constructed. It sure seems like I am a person. And if I am a person, that's a really difficult thing to wrap our heads around philosophically. And it even seems like I'm a person that see, that's the same person over time. <clears throat> I know some people have different internal psychological experiences where they feel like they're completely different than they were 10 years ago or 20 years ago. Not me. I feel like since I had memories, maybe four or something, I still feel like I'm the same person getting older, gaining experiences. So that that internal psychological experience of the self for me is incredibly powerful. And I think that's one of the reasons it's so hard for me to shake this idea that I am something. Maybe I'm not, you know, maybe, maybe my illusion is very strong. That's just kind of hard to accept given my own internal experience. And of course, even when I say my own internal experience, that seems to only make sense to me if we accept the existence of a self. When I experience phenomena as I interact with the world, I have developed this explanation for what's going on that I don't know how it can be compatible with um, what you've just presented, which is 
it seems like I, there is a point of perspective that I have, or my, my perspective, we can put that in quotation marks. But I also believe that you, or at least what I'm referencing when I use that term, also have a perspective. And it's the same, and it's very similar in the sense that you, there is this perspective and that perspective, and they're not ultimately the same perspective. Doesn't that imply some kind of a self, or, or at least some kind of a uh, true metaphysical difference between the perspectives? No, not at all. For one thing, um, uh, your perspective is always changing, and my perspective is always changing, first of all. And that's a really important part of this. The, the sort of logical proof that is given about the self is that it's always changing. It doesn't remain the same. And mm. so at the minimum, you have to say that any kind of such conception is, is a shorthand for what, in fact, is always in flux. And so once it's always in flux, uh, going back to Aristotle, um, something that's always in flux undermines its ability to have an essence. And the main Buddhist critique is about this notion of essence. Mm-hmm. All right, now this is directly related to Square One, the book that I just released. I have a section on this idea of universal flux. And this is one of the most interesting parts of our conversation, in my opinion, is how central the idea is of flux. The argument goes, essentially, that if things are always changing, then at any point they aren't really one particular way, they're always turning into something else, and therefore you don't have essence. This, I think, is fundamentally backwards. In order to have change, you must have essence. You have to have something to change in order for anything to be changing. So my conception of flux is you might have things changing over time. So time one, you have you know, bits of matter arranged in a particular way. Time two, you have bits of matter arranged another way. Then there is change over those times, but at any given instant, the thing is exactly what it is. It has essence. Now, what's really, really interesting is where infinity plays into the mix, as you'll hear shortly. So then I ask her if what appears to be true differences in perspective between her conscious perspective and my conscious perspective. If that's artificial, does that imply that really there's only one consciousness that has artificial divisions between it? So do you, would you say then the claim could be something like this, that what exists is not a bunch of selves with fundamentally different perspectives, that there's one type of thing that's out there or one type of consciousness and it's artificially broken up between no no no, no we're not going there either okay so that would be to hypothesize a, a, a one consciousness okay so any the, the 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 aim the target that the buddhists are aiming at is the hypothesization or the essentialization so be it one big thing or a bunch of little individual ones the problem with all of it is not to see that every single one of those things is constructed from out of many different parts, and those are constantly shifting, and the way that we name them depends on what particular perspective we're taking at any one particular moment, which itself is always changing. And so there are, there's energy, there's phenomena, things are happening, mm-hmm. but none of them have an essential identity or essential essence. All right, now this is really the central part of our conversation and arguably of Buddhism. So when you say things are happening, but if they don't have an identity, then they're not really things, right? No, that's the whole point, is that uh, things don't need an identity in order to, to be there. So what are you referencing when you use the term things? I'm always referencing it from whatever particular angle that I'm taking. So, you know, you do need to give things identity in common human communication, Mm -hmm. and you do that all the time. But those, again, are products of our conceptions, our set of concepts, our set of constructions, and they don't necessarily belong to the thing as such. So there is no thing per se? No. Everything's in flux. Everything's constantly changing. So that right there is where um, Dr. Yatsa and I have to part ways. I don't think it makes sense to say that things don't need identity. In fact, as is one of the central parts of my book, all existent things must necessarily be identical with themselves. In order to exist, you must be some way. You might even say, to exist is to be some way. 
in whatever way that you are, that's the way that you are, you have self-identity. So the Buddhist teaching is denying the existence, really, of true identity, or what it's saying is, insofar as there is identity, it is only conceptual identity and not actual identity. It, it is illusory identity and not real identity. And this is kind of you know, diametrically opposed to my own position. And now here's a little tidbit that I just love. This idea, which you're about to hear, even though it just came out briefly, it is absolutely central, and I'm going to talk a lot about it. But there is and everything, so, but there's not one particular there's thing. There's not in everything either. So you're just, then you're just moving to making this one big thing in the sky or something. <laughs> so no, there isn't. The universe is infinite. Okay, so as you just throws it in there, the universe is infinite. It comes up later, and I talk about it a lot, how I think infinity is the cause of a great deal of confusion in the world. And in fact, I would say it is central to these claims in Buddhism. So for that something, is it, does it have any constituent parts to it? Yeah, but each of those parts themselves are made up of constituent parts mm -hmm. down to an infinite regress. So there's no base anything? No. All right, now I'm going to play that again for you. So for that something, is it, does it have any constituent parts to it? Yeah, but each of those parts themselves are made up of constituent parts mm -hmm. down to an infinite regress. So there's no base anything? No. Isn't this interesting that, though it may not appear so at first glance, a, and a pillar, you might even say the pillar, of this central Buddhist teaching about the non-identity of things is infinity. And as I have said in my writing and elsewhere, Infinity is, I consider it to be logical. The idea that you could complete an infinity or have an actual infinity or an actual infinite regress is logically contradictory precisely because you run into these type of errors. The claim is that th things exist. They, are, they have constituent parts to them, but those constituent parts have constituent parts have constituent parts ad infinitum. If you follow that logic, it means that really there are no constituent parts. There are no fundamental, actual constituent parts. You kind of go all the way down and it dissolves into nothingness. Now, usually I would be t making that argument to say, well, therefore, it must be the case that if you have an object with constituent parts, it must be constructed from fundamental indivisible base units because otherwise you run into a logical contradiction. And she's using it to say, no, this is actually the truth of the matter is that this is why things don't have identity is because infinity. So for those of you who wonder why I talk about infinity a lot, this is one of the reasons. And it's fascinating that it comes in Buddhism, right? So if we're talking about infinity as it correlates to Buddhist metaphysics and really the central, central idea that every part contains within it an infinite regress, which, I've, which I think is logically contradictory. So let me present to you an alternative hypothesis that to the extent anything has a constituent part, it must have fundamental base units. In the physical world, that means there is a fundamental base unit of space-time. If we're talking about, let's say, for example, there are selves, that would imply that the self is some kind of a simple, indivisible base unit. If we're talking in mathematics, this comes up all the time. When we're talking about distances, if we're talking about everything from circles and talking about calculus, in all of our calculations, there is a implied base unit, otherwise you get nonsense, especially comes up in geometry. So anywhere that you have anything, it is either the case that you have simple substances, you have simple base units, or you have constructions of those base units. That's it. There's no infinitely large or infinitely small thing, because that would deny that the thing has identity, which is logically impossible. All right, so now we transition into the second part of the conversation, which... I ask because I know there's a lot of Westerners who like to import Eastern philosophy into their worldviews to try to argue for the existence of irrational positions. And they use, you know, cryptic Eastern paradoxical phrases to try to say, ah, look, the reality is contradictory. So I wanted to give her a softball and ask her about how we should understand how Buddhists use paradoxes. Are we supposed to take paradoxes literally, or are we supposed to solve the paradoxes? 
what is the Buddhist take on paradox or even logical contradiction? Like, are, are these things that are meant to get at a deeper premise, to get us to, to realize our constructions about the world? Or do they accept, look, there are some paradoxes that are actually there and you just kind of have to, you have to deal with it? It's the former. The former. Okay, so for logic specifically, would you say there, in Buddhist thinking there is any acceptance of actual logical contradiction? You can make a logical contradiction, you know, you can make it all the time. It depends what it means and how you're using it. Mm -hmm. So if I say something like, you know, I exist and I don't exist. You can say that, but it doesn't make any sense. <laughs> so then, we, you know, I'm not gonna, we're not going to bother with stuff okay. that makes no sense. You can say that. I love that. I love the matter of fact. Well, that makes no sense. And it's damn true. It makes absolutely no sense. <laughs> it, and it, and every, every utterance depends on its rhetorical context and what you're trying to do with it and how you're using it. Okay. And so any one single utterance taken out of context can be interpreted in a lot of different ways. And that's an, another major part. It's very similar to what I've already been saying, that our notion of ourself it depends on what perspective we take on it. And mm -hmm. the same thing for language. So that you certainly can construct a paradox, but um, what's the status of that paradox? Is it an artificial game or whatever? I mean, the, the, the thing about paradox in certain kinds of Buddhist texts, it it is the former of the two options you gave that a seeming paradox requires us to maybe move to another level to understand certain assumptions that we're bringing to that paradox. Yes, I think that that makes a great deal of sense. And, and, and I, I can, you know, refer also to the law of the excluded middle, which is like saying, you know, either I exist or I don't exist. I, I've actually worked on this topic a little bit. and. Um, and the law of the excluded middle depends on a faulty presumption that there's a clear um, dividing line between exist and doesn't exist, or yes and no. And it's a bifurcated line which, yeah, that's a paradox if, if you accept that assumption. But mm -hmm. if you don't accept that assumption, the whole thing falls away. So would you say something like that, specifically on the, the law of the excluded middle, that it presupposes identity, or it, it presupposes yeah. that there boundaries. are... Boundaries. Exactly. The meaningfulness and absoluteness of boundaries. Yes, that's right. Absolutely. So in my conversations that I've had with a lot of people, especially maybe if they haven't heard this perspective, the idea that in Eastern philosophy you em they embrace actual logical contradiction. This is just this is just an error. It's not not supposed to No, not, not at all. No, right. The you know, they're not idiots, you know. <laughs> um they they're, they're... I, again I love her frankness, like actual logical contradictions, come on, they're not idiots. I appreciate that perspective. And it's an interesting point about the law of the excluded middle. This is also something I cover briefly in my book. I do think it's the case that the law of the excluded middle is a foundational law of logic, but I think it's actually fairly simple. There are no gradients of existence. We only get gray types of existence with, if we're ambiguous with language. So this is an example I give in square one. I say, you know, the sentence, I am wearing two shoes and a top hat right now. It's like, well, is that true or is it false? The law of the excluded middle, it's either true or false. You could say, if we were going to be ambiguous, you could say, well, it's half true because I'm wearing two shoes, but I'm not wearing a hat. That works in colloquial language, but in, if we're going to be really strict about it, it's just simply a false claim. A proposition like that contains two parts, that I, I am wearing two shoes and I am wearing a top hat. And if both of those aren't true, then the proposition is simply false. Or an example to talk about an existent thing is, there exists a cat with black hair and an elephant snout. Now, we wouldn't say that that type of thing half exists because there are black cats out there, though they don't have elephant snouts. We would just say, no, those type of things don't exist. We could say, each individual property of a thing exists, and those properties that don't exist don't exist. So that's the only place that we get vagueness. I don't think it makes any sense whatsoever to say in a literal way that there is some thing or some property that is somewhere between existent and non-existent, that it's somehow half-existent. That's just a function of language, not metaphysical reality. All right, okay, so the last thing I asked her has to do again with this conception of boundaries. 
I've seriously entertained the idea that all boundaries are artificial. But then I run into one example that I'll be damned if it's not a case of what I consider to be a genuine boundary in the world. And this is how she handles my question. Okay, so the last question that I want to ask you is going back to the consciousness and also has to do with this seeming distinction between things. That theory that there is a seems to be a unique difference between the contents of my awareness, the contents of my consciousness, the feelings that I'm having, and yours. Mm -hmm. Is that a objective distinction of any, if I had to theorize of any meaningful objective distinction that isn't relative, that seems to be absolute and mm -hmm. talking about something in the world, that would be right up there probably number one. It's, it seems to be that, you know, even my my perspective, even from the sense of like, I'm looking at you from this side of the table, you're looking at me from that side of the table. Though the actual awareness, isn't that something that would be non, a non-relative distinction? Well, that's one of the hardest things for anybody to explain is the so-called existence of other minds. Yeah. And um, that was a debate that was taken up at a certain point in Buddhist philosophy and I don't think was satisfactorily dealt with. Okay, so that's not a fully satisfactory answer, so I, I ask it again in a different way. Okay, so let me ask you, let me, maybe this is a better way of phrasing it. Are there any, is the claim that distinctions between things are relative, is that a, an absolute claim? Is that saying in, there is no circumstance in which you have a, true absolute distinction between things that isn't a construction yeah because whatever the thing is itself can be deconstructed so would this be a circumstance then with the existence of other minds where it would seem like that, that distinction is not conceptual or constructed it seems like we're talking about things separate, in a sense separate, the distinction is separate from our minds, our, our, our conception of it. Would that be an example of a... I'm not so sure because you're trying to pose them as opposites and I'm not sure they're opposites. And I think it would be really important, first of all, to think about the question of your mind versus what's in my purse. Mm -hmm. So I think we're mixing two different problems. One of them has to do with the nature of consciousness mm -hmm. and one of them has to do with the nature of things and absolute difference. Okay, so she's, she's very uncomfortable with this idea that there are absolute non-relative differences between things. And I think, again, this is one of the central ideas in Buddhism. And in fact, this is, you know, the reason that I'm not a Buddhist, I, I'm not a, a Hindu, is because I do think there are absolute distinctions between things, namely the ones that I'm talking about. But I give her even another um, more difficult example of what appear to be genuine differences between things. But what if I say, okay, forget differences in consciousness. What if I say the contents of my own perception, if I'm talking about my visual field, mm -hmm. there is kind of a tan blob here and there's kind of a blue blob there mm -hmm. in my visual field. Now, they have some constructed relationships. So, for example, if this, that blob is over here, that blob is over there, that only makes sense kind of as a together, as they're relative to one another. But the actual feeling or the actual like qualitative experience of these things seems to be different seems to be meaningfully different that it wouldn't be a construction right haven't we found like a a non-relative distinction mm -hmm. in my own conscious experience Me, say the difference between the ex experience of blue and tan for yeah. example that's a much faster way of putting it yeah <laughs> so they're different yeah but they're on a continuum with each other uh, the continuum being color color okay and that's where we had to end, end the conversation. Um, you know, if I had a little bit more time, maybe I would have said, okay, the experience of blue and the, you know, the, the taste of cherries or something. Uh, I think if we push the envelope here, we can find absolute distinctions between phenomena. The feeling of seeing blue and the tasting of cherries have some genuine absolute qualitative difference between them. And if that's true, that implies that this is non-relative. It's a non-relative distinction.
So again, I love the idea, especially in Hinduism, of this idea that all is one, that all divisions are arbitrary, but I believe it's false. I think there are some meaningful divisions in the world. I think there's, I don't think that I am you. I don't think that I am everything. I think that I am a something who has boundaries, and you are a something that has boundaries. And even if neither of us are conceiving of those boundaries, I still believe those boundaries exist. Not to mention what I also conceive as, of being as actual boundaries between base units of um, physical reality. So clumps of matter over here and clumps of matter over there have meaningful, absolute distinctions and boundaries between them that are non-conceptual. So I really love the aesthetic beauty and power of thinking of uh, boundaries this way as the mystical pers perspective, but I am not persuaded because I think some boundaries do exist. Now the trouble... <laughs> The trouble is, if boundaries do exist, and if boundaries of the self exist, well, then you still got a heck of a difficult problem that I'm trying to solve, which is how can we make sense of that? And right now, the most powerful theoretical explanation I have for the boundaries of the self is what philosophers and theologians call the soul. You can conceive of the soul as being a bounded person. Where my person ends is the boundary of my soul. <laughs> Sounds ridiculous and uh, doesn't sound particularly scientific, but unfortunately I think it's what follows if it is true that um, I am a something and not merely an illusion. So that is all for today. I hope you guys enjoyed this interview breakdown. I'm so behind on these other breakdowns. I might do a couple more in a row. This next month is going to be pretty smashing. So get ready for a spectacular march talking about mathematics and infinities with some special guests that I'll reveal shortly. All right, that's all for today. Have a great week.